At 10.35, thriller movie action in Hot Target. This is LWT with News at 10. News at 10 with Trevor McDonald. Labour landslide sweeps Blair into Downing Street. Major steps down and finds time to watch some cricket. The face of defeat that symbolised a Tory disaster. And the children who will be moving in at number 10. Good evening. Tony Blair was carried into Downing Street today on a political landslide and on a wave of Labour jubilation. He'd have a majority in the Commons of 179, Labour's best result ever. For the Conservatives, it was a nightmare. Their first election defeat since 1974, and their worst since 1832. This is the new political map of the United Kingdom. Labour will have 419 MPs, the Conservatives 165, with none at all from either Scotland or Wales. The Liberal Democrats more than doubled their representation to 46. Others, including nationalists, got 29. An overall Labour majority, as we said, of 179. When he walked in triumph into Downing Street at lunchtime today, the new Prime Minister promised to work for all the people. He said his government would take practical measures in pursuit of noble causes, adding there'd be no return to the past. Mr. Major, out of power, announced he was standing down as Conservative Party leader. He said, when the curtain falls, it's time to leave the stage. Our political editor, Michael Brunson, saw the reins of power pass into Mr. Blair's hands and the political torch to a new generation. Tony Blair, leaving his home with Cherie for the palace with a wave to his children, has always said he would do things his way. That meant that the Prime Ministerial Daimler sent to collect him had barely gone ten yards before he ordered it to stop so that he could greet the crowds near his home. And then tracked by the ITN helicopter, he arrived at Buckingham Palace, at which point he formally became the first Labour Premier for 18 years and the youngest this century. He's 44 next Tuesday. Meanwhile, some of the Blair children's friends were already in Downing Street where others were already practicing their flag-waving. And where, on his return from the palace, Prime Minister Blair again stopped the car, got out, and began a remarkable walkabout. He and eventually Cherie too, greeting the public, specially admitted for this moment. <laughs> then the first formal declaration of the values which will guide the Blair administration. It shall be a government rooted in strong values the values of justice and progress and community, the values that have guided me all my political life, but a government ready with the courage to embrace the new ideas necessary to make those values live again for today's world. A government of practical measures in pursuit of noble causes. Next, one for the family album, as Ewan, Nicholas and Catherine joined their parents on the steps of their new home and a public display of affection by mum and dad, albeit encouraged by the photographers, before an inspection of what will eventually be the new Blair household. Eventually, because the Blairs will not move in for a couple of weeks, but even so, the removal vans have already arrived. The transfer of power is still brisk. In his speech, Tony Blair had paid tribute to the dignity shown by John Major during his last days in office. The outgoing Prime Minister himself was clearly anxious that his place in morning. the history books should be secured. I hope as I leave Downing Street this morning that I can say with some accuracy that the country is in far better shape than it was when I entered Downing Street. The economy is booming, 
interest rates low, inflation low, unemployment falling. But for those in the cabinet and outside it who were hoping that he'd stay as party leader to help heal the wounds, he had immediate news. When the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage, and that is what I propose to do. I shall therefore advise my parliamentary colleagues that I believe that it would be appropriate for them to consider the selection of a new leader of the Conservative Party to lead the party through opposition during the years that lie immediately ahead. The hurt has just been too great. Though outwardly calm, John Major and his family are devastated by what they see as the disloyalty of his backbenchers as they fought their Eurosceptic battles. He wants no more of things going wrong. But they did to the very end. A police attempt to speed his way to his audience with the Queen by piloting his car up the wrong side of Whitehall went awry, though eventually the backup Prime Ministerial limo made it to Buckingham Palace. And it eventually took him to the place where he's often found some solace during his difficult times, the Oval Cricket Ground just across the Thames. It has affected him, and now with Norma Major's help, he will hope for an easier time of it. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. Mr Blair has already appointed the key members of his government, beginning with John Prescott. He'll be Deputy Prime Minister and Transport and Environment Suprema. As expected, Gordon Brown is the new Chancellor, Robin Cook goes to the Foreign Office, Jack Straw to the Home Office. Our political correspondent Hugh Pym reports. Comrades in opposition for so many years, now colleagues in power. Robin Cook, the new Foreign Secretary, and Jack Straw, Home Secretary, had plenty to talk about. New staff, new car, and all the other trappings of office. Robin Cook savouring the palatial interior of the Foreign Office and finding out exactly where and how he's supposed to start work. Well, I think I'd take the jacket off to get down to business. Before he got down to business, Gordon Brown, the new Chancellor, was given a warm welcome by a small crowd gathered outside the Treasury. It was repeated by staff and civil servants inside, the first time anyone can remember that happening for many years. And for John Prescott, the job he coveted, Deputy Prime Minister and a super ministry to go with it, environment and transport combined. I've always wanted to do this. David Blunkett was another to get the early call from Tony Blair. Education, as expected, will be his portfolio. We're planning legislation, but above all, we're planning a culture change, a change in the way the department operates, the way it relates to the education service, the way it relates to employability in some of our most deprived communities and the way the employment service itself operates. And with Whitehall staff watching the arrival of new labour, Mr Blunkett was quickly into his department. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Also carrying a ministerial red box is Margaret Beckett, the new president of the Board of Trade. Lord Irvine as Lord Chancellor, the only other appointment so far. And for these new ministers, there's no pause for breath after a punishing campaign. Gordon Brown has already submitted his welfare to work plans to the Treasury. And on Monday, Robin Cook is away on European business. And next Thursday, at their first cabinet meeting, they'll have to finalise the package of measures they want to see included in the first Queen's speech of this new Labour government. Hugh Pym, News at 10, Downing Street. The opinion polls had always pointed to a Labour win, but the scale of their victory surprised almost everyone. As declaration followed declaration, a relentless tide kept on running for Labour and against the Conservatives. Most defeats were accepted with good grace, but not all. Tim Ewart saw the highs and lows of an extraordinary night. The Blairs travelled victorious to London on a nighttime flight from Teesside. Waiting for them, jubilant supporters celebrating every triumph, especially the scalp of Michael Portillo. As John Major arrived at his Huntington constituency, the Labour landslide was turning into an avalanche of Tory humiliation. Humiliation for David Meller, beaten by Labour, barracked by referendum party leader Sir James Goldsmith. And we have so the Humiliation for Neil Hamilton, beset by sleaze allegations, ousted by former television reporter Martin Bell. You have lit a beacon which will shed light in some dark corners and illuminate the Mother of Parliament itself.
Mr Major was welcomed with brave smiles and warm applause at Conservative Party headquarters, but as Mr Portillo greeted him, they had become yesterday's men overnight. Politics is a rough old trade. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. Neil Kinnock knows the bitterness of defeat, but now he was celebrating New Labour's victory beside an apparently preoccupied John Prescott and the party's top spin doctor, Peter Mandelson. But as the band played on, the night belonged to Tony Blair and his rapturous supporters. A new dawn has broken, he told them, and it is wonderful. After an unforgettable night, that dawn was breaking over a parliament Labour could finally call its own. Tim Hewitt, News at 10, Central London. Mr Major's decision to stand down as Conservative Party leader immediately raised the question of the succession. So far, only Kenneth Clark, the pro-European former Chancellor, has said he'll definitely be a candidate. The Eurosceptic Michael Portillo will not be. He was among seven Conservative cabinet ministers who lost their seats. Here's ITN's Robert Moore. Twig, Stephen, Labour Party, 20,000... This was the moment early this morning when the Conservative Party knew it was facing not just a defeat, but a disaster. The loss of Michael Portillo's seat has also dramatically changed the nature of the leadership contest. But as he emerged from his home today, the former Defence Secretary explained his main concern would be simply finding work. Uh, I don't know what, uh, what I might be regarded as suitable for. I've certainly got to make a living. The former Chancellor Kenneth Clark, stripped of his ministerial car, was also coming to terms with a new reality, today using a rental van. He has already declared himself a contender for the leadership of the party, but he is seen by many as too sympathetic to Europe to stand a good chance of winning. There are at least seven others, apart from Mr Clark, likely to seek the party leadership. Among the front-runners is the former Deputy Prime Minister Michael Heseltine. Others include the Welsh Secretary William Hague, Gillian Shepherd, and Stephen Dorrell. And on the Eurosceptic side of the party, Michael Howard, Peter Lilly and John Redwood all seem certain to be candidates. But few of the contenders would talk openly about their chances. No, I think it's the right for the whole party to uh, take a period of cool and calm reflection. That's what I've advised the whole party to do. That's what I will do myself. Do you have any leadership ambitions yourself, Mr Heseltine? All these matters will be resolved by the party. Thank you. Does your leadership? I, I have no more. Amid the debris of last night's devastating events, the party is bracing itself for a protracted leadership struggle. The contest itself could take time to organise, not least because it's the job of the chairman of the 1922 committee, who was himself swept aside by the Labour landslide. It could be July at the earliest, before a depleted and traumatised Conservative party has its new leader. Robert Morn is at 10 at Conservative Central Office. The Liberal Democrats won 28 extra seats to take their total to 46, despite a slight fall in their overall share of the poll. And the 46th was a desperately close-run thing in the very last constituency to declare. Richard Lindley reports. This is an absolutely sensational result for the Liberal Democrats. Tonight, another Conservative, former Minister Jerry Malone, lost his seat. By just two votes, Winchester went Liberal Democrat. It was 4.40 this morning when their leader arrived in London from his Yeovil constituency to join fellow Liberal Democrats partying in a pizza parlour. We are the largest force of Liberal Democrats and Liberals that this country has had since the days of Lloyd George. It was indeed a triumph for Paddy Ashdown. Later this morning he predicted they'd become the most effective voice of opposition in Parliament. 21,082. In Torbay, another close result as the Conservative Rupert Allison was defeated by the Liberal Democrat candidate by 12 votes after four recounts. Breaking out of their southwestern stronghold, the Liberal Democrats took constituencies like Southport and Merseyside and went on to win in places which they'd never considered vulnerable. Although their share of the vote was slightly down, they won twice as many seats as they did at the last election. I'm fighting now to be the cornerstone, the rock upon which we can build a new and modern constitution for our country. 
The Lib Dem leadership believes the party's new strength in the Commons will make Labour honour the agreement they've reached on constitutional reform. It gives a two-thirds majority of the people of this country for constitutional change. We should be there to make sure the Labour Party live up to the promises and commitments they made with us. But Labour in power may not be quite as cooperative as it was in opposition. Richard Lindley, News at 10. More election news ahead tonight, including what Sinn Féin's gains mean for the future of the peace process. Inside number 10 with the Blairs, Mrs Blair plans to be a working mum. And sign of the times, the young Labour gun who routed a Tory grandee. I think I'll have to buy a newspaper and, you know, see what, whether the when state opening of Parliament is. I'll just buy a train ticket and off, off I'll go. When an iron clogs up... Welcome back. The reversal of political fortunes last night was typified nowhere better than in Shipley near Bradford in West Yorkshire. There the veteran Sir Marcus Fox, chairman of the Conservative Backbench Committee, was defending a 12,000 majority over Labour. He lost to a 24-year-old who said he'd have to buy a newspaper to find out when he had to go to Parliament. Norman Rees reports. Christopher Leslie spent most of today trying to explain how a Labour candidate barely out of school so comprehensively beat a Tory grandee. People saw a contrast between, you know, same old Tories and, and new young Labour. Leslie, Christopher Michael, 22,000. Labour were ecstatic. Sir Marcus Fox, local MP for 27 years, was out. Shipley's voters basked in today's sunshine and the unexpected media attention. The overwhelming feeling amongst everyday people is that they wanted a change. In my lifetime, I was... Four-year-old. Norman Rees, News at 10, Shipley. The Conservative disaster in Scotland, where they lost all their 10 seats, was partly because of the first-past-the-post system, which they have supported. Their share of the poll was actually four points higher than the Liberal Democrats. But this was the result in seats. Labour way out in front with 56, up 6. Conservatives nil. Liberal Democrats 10, up 3. The Scottish National Party 6, up 2. From Edinburgh, David Rose reports. All night long the Tories' heads rolled, much worse than the polls had forecast, until today Scotland found itself a Tory-free zone. Even the biggest names were thrown out. 18,000. Yeah! Ian Lang beaten by the Scottish National Party. But it was Labour who celebrated Malcolm Rifkin's fall. <laughs> and the seat they wanted most of all, Michael Forsyth. It's very unlikely that for the foreseeable future I will be involved in politics. Although I will remain a member of the Conservative Party the Scottish Tories did get 17% of the poll, four more than the Liberal Democrats, who have 10 Scottish seats. One clear result of the extraordinary vote in Scotland, the Scottish Parliament should be working here in Edinburgh by the millennium. The Scottish National Party, with 22% of the poll, doubled their seats to six, compared with 1992. The Conservative wipeout has profound constitutional implications. I mean, for example, at a simple level, I mean, who's going to be the shadow secretary of state? Well, clearly it can't be a Tory, there aren't any. Uh, so it'll have to be the SNP or the Liberals, or perhaps we'll take turns at it. The Conservatives' humiliating situation will be most evident at Westminster, where they're going to have to appoint Scots who represent English seats to shadow Labour Scottish ministers. There's also the difficulty that the Liberal Democrats and Scottish National Party now have some claim to be the true opposition in Scotland. David Rose, News at 10, Edinburgh. The Sinn Féin leaders Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness both got themselves elected in Northern Ireland, though they're not expected to take their seats at Westminster. Here's our island correspondent, John Irvine. The big battle was for the Catholic vote, and it was the militants led by Gerry Adams who made the gains. The losers here were the moderates of the SDLP, they may share the goal of a united Ireland, but Sinn Féin supporters berated Joe Hendren. The man Mr Adams replaces as West Belfast MP. 
building and rebuilding the peace process is a Sinn Féin priority. I'm sure it will be the new government's priority also, and that should be commenced without further delay. Sinn Féin's success was not confined to Belfast. Martin McGuinness says he won in Mid-Ulster because of his party's peace strategy, but unionists will regard it as an endorsement of IRA violence. Ian Paisley's DUP lost one seat, the Ulster Unionists gained one, and with 10 MPs, David Trimble's party is the largest by far. He will now be pressing for devolution. The Conservative government was not interested in returning power to the people. I hope this government lives up to its rhetoric and takes some actual steps to do so. Tony Blair has yet to appoint his Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, but it will probably be Mo Molum, and the problem she will face is clear. How to create peace by reconciling the divisions over national identity that have once again been exposed so clearly. John Irvine, News at 10, Belfast. Plaid Cymru held on to their four existing seats in Wales as the Conservatives were completely wiped out. The Welsh Nationalist leader, David Wigley, said his party would ensure that the new Labour government would deliver their promise on a new Welsh Assembly. Now back to the Blairs and their young children, they'll have to get used to the intense media interest and the inevitable security. And it's a long time since their new home, number 10 Downing Street, was a family house. Jo Andrews reports. The family who have been affected most by Labour's victory is Tony Blair's own. In a sense, Ewan, who's 13, Nicholas, 11, and Catherine, who's 9, ceased to be ordinary children as their father stood on the brink of his extraordinary victory. Ordinary children don't stay up late to get a cuddle at an election count. They don't fetch the newspapers the day after to find the family on every front page. Later, Catherine and her cousin Lucy peeked in frank astonishment at the multitude assembled on their doorstep. And then it was off for a first look at their new home in Downing Street. This afternoon, the Blairs wandered through the formal areas. They will live in a private flat in the attic. But for a family of five, at present, it is simply too small. So what are the options? The children could take over the front rooms. The dining area probably stays much the same. But another option is to take over part of the rather larger private apartment at number 11, with a study for Cherie, a bedroom suite, playroom, and even a music room where Mr Blair could relax with his guitar. Much interest also revolves around Cherie Booth. She's the first Prime Minister's wife to be a full-time working mother, as she told one school child during the campaign she won't be giving that up. I'm going to be uh, going to work and looking after my children. So I think I'll probably have a, a very busy life, don't you? And would you give up your job? Oh, no. 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 I think I'm too young to retire. <laughs> <laughs> but tonight, the young Blair children arrived back at their old London home after a day they'll never forget. Joe Andrews, News at 10. And now after his own grueling campaign, our political editor, Michael Brunson. Mike, what kind of government will Tony Blair's be? Well, he was saying today that it's not going to be one that's dominated by dogma. And that, I think, it means this, that he will not, for example, go for privatisation for the sake of it, as he thinks the Tories have done, but nor will he go for the old-style nationalisation of old Labour. He set himself some very, very specific pledges, things like cutting class sizes, reducing juvenile crime and so on, and he, uh, having criticised the Tories so much for breaking, breaking their promises, he's simply going to say, judge me on whether I get to those points or not. Have you known anything quite like last night? Well, I've known high moments of political drama. I mean, I, I, I think I could compare Mrs Thatcher's original win. I think Geoffrey Howe's resignation speech in the House of Commons. I think of Mr Major's challenge in the Rose Garden. But what makes the difference this time is that those were just drama. This is an, a moment when the British people have spoken with a strength of voice that one has never, ever seen before. And you only had to see that walk up Downing Street and those faces of the people who expect so much from Tony Blair, those who wanted to be there, that you realise that it was momentous. Michael Brunson, thank you. And finally, a last look at some of today's historic images, the pictures which tell the story of a night of high drama and Tony Blair's journey south to Downing Street.
When the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage, and that is what I propose to do. Time now to do. Thank you. And that's the way the news looks tonight on the day that New Labour's new dawn changed the political face of Britain.